Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARC's weekly fireside chat. My name is Sam Lewis. I'm the executive director of ARC, the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Thank you for joining us today. I am so happy to have you all here. We have some incredible panelists uh, that will share so much of what's going on when it comes to the reunification of families and incarceration. But first, I'd like to go through a few instructions just to make sure that you're able to participate fully in our fireside chat. At the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, a laptop, or desktop, there's a Q&A box that you can click and you can send us questions directly. If we're unable to answer your questions during the show, we will email you and answer them. Also, if you'd like to follow up and send additional questions, please email us at info at antirecidivism.org. Please take a moment to write that down. That's info at antirecidivism.org. And we will also have this on the screen towards the end of our show. Now, I'd like to introduce or have our panelists introduce themselves. So Liz, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Sam. Uh, so my name is Liz Rios, and I am with Center for Restorative Justice Works, which is an organization that encompasses the Get on the Bus program, uh, which focuses in um, basically reunifying uh, children with their incarcerated parents. In addition to that, my personal connection to this is as a child, I had my father incarcerated for about seven years of my life. Thank you so much, Liz. Stephen, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Stephen Green. I'm with Project Rebound. I'm a full-time student at Cal State Fullerton. I've got almost 28 years in the carceral system. I was a community LWAP by Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown in 2018. And I have uh, 16 years of visiting room experience with my lovely daughters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. LWAP, by the way, audience means uh, Steve, Stephen's sentence was commuted from life without the possibility of parole by Governor Brown. Courtney, would you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Grady, and I currently work for Girl Scouts of Eastern Missouri here in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was program coordinator for a program called Girl Scouts beyond bars and what that program does is we do have we serve up to 40 girls and with those girls we allow them to continue to have a relationship with their mother and we take them to the prison visit their mother everything but they also have a bond outside of the prison with each other i was a part of that program for about three and a half years thank you so much courtney and welcome to the show uh, Alyssa, could you please introduce yourself hello uh, my name's Alyssa. My mom has been locked up for 14 years now. She has LWAP and I get to go see her with Get on the Bus. So I'm very familiar with Get on the Bus and reunification means a lot when it comes to my mom because me and her are very close. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you so much for joining our show and sharing with us. Thank you uh, for having me. You're truly welcome. Uh, so just for the audience to know, uh, the Get on the Bus program is a powerful program. I've been home now almost nine years, but I actually participated in that program when, when my daughter was young. Uh, these were opportunities for her to be able to come visit with me during special holidays and get on the bus, provided a way for her to get to me and be able to see me when I was further and further away from home in Southern California. Uh, so thank you for that program. And we'll have more about that program as we move through our show today. Uh, listen, Liz, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. What, what was or is your experience in staying connected to your parents during incarceration? Like so my mom has been locked up for a really long time, ever since I was really young. It started off with my grandparents taking me, my grandma and my grandpa. And it's like a, a two hour ride from where we were staying at. So then uh, once we heard about get on the bus and how it was a free ride and how we didn't have to pay for nothing and we got snacks and and uh, shirts and all these free commodities and stuff. We we obviously hopped right on the bus cause you know, like free stuff, you know, and I get a free ride to go see my mom. So thanks to, to get on the bus and stuff, it's really helped me stay connected with my mom and, and keep our relationship strong. And uh, if it wasn't for get on the bus, it would, it would just mostly be like phone calls and stuff, which she barely gets as it is. But I mean, if, yeah, mostly it's mostly I, I give my thanks to get on the bus for my relationship with my mom. Thank you, thank you, Alyssa. Liz, could you could you share with us what what the experience has been like for you to be able to stay connected with your parent while she was while she was away? Well, uh, I had the opposite experience. Um, in my case, um, get on the bus programs. I like get on the bus were not around uh, when my dad was in prison. So. 
unfortunately, the seven years that he was there, I only got to see him once. Um, and it was through a glass partition, uh, you know, no contact whatsoever. It was, there was a faulty phone, couldn't really hear him. So uh, my experience was, um, you know, the lack of those resources. Um, like I said, within those seven years, I probably spoke to him on the phone maybe three times, saw him once. Letter writing was intermittent. So there was definitely um, a need from when I was growing up for programs like Get on the Bus. So, um, you know, what we struggled with, obviously, with the financial resources, uh, we did not have a reliable vehicle. So my dad was about maybe four or five hours away from where we were at the time. So it was a challenge for us. We just literally did not have the resources to make those visits possible. So for me, my, my experience was very, very challenging. And it was mainly because of the lack of um, financial resources. Just so I'm clear, I just, uh, Liz, what, was this here in California? This was in California, yes. So we lived in the LA area and um, quite frankly, I, I don't know where my dad was incarcerated. Um, I recall it being a, so he was incarcerated from the age of 10 to 17 for, for me. So um, I was very close to him. So it was already a bit of a challenge. So even when I went to see him that first time around, um, it, it was, it was, you know, it was a cold environment. Um, it, the conversation was very limited. Like I said, we had a faulty phone, so it was kind of more gestures than anything. So um, it was in the in California. He was, from my understanding, a state institution. So, like I said, for us in our case, it was it was a bit of a a challenge just to go visit him. And I asked you that for a reason. So this morning I was going over the budgets for CDCR for the past few years uh, since 2012, and so. In 2012, the budget, as it's listed, was around $9 billion. This would have been $9 billion. And uh, the population within the Department of Corrections at that time was about 170,000, maybe more. Here we are, 2020. The population in the state of California is now about 125, 126,000 people. You would think the budget would go down, correct? The proposed budget for CDCR today is... 15 billion, almost 16, but it's 15 billion, 900 million. So you might as well just say 16 billion, almost double the amount that it was in 2012 with a far lower population. I say that to make the point, 1% of that budget could fund programs like get on the bus so that our children can see their parents, visit with their parents, and it wouldn't be such a struggle. I just wanted to put that out there because 1% of that budget would be about, uh, about 160 million annually. Can you imagine what programs could be developed in? Uh, just, just thoughts. Uh, so, so as I was going through those today, and, and the reason why I was going through those today, just to share with the audience, when people talk about defund the police, it's not, at least as, my, as least as I understand, it's not to just get rid of police departments, but take money from police departments and reallocate them to programs that would help our community. So maybe we need to look at that 16 billion with a B and think about how we can do better with families, children, and, re and reunifying families and children within our system. But, but moving on, I don't want to take up too much time. And in terms of barriers to, that children face in, when they want to stay in connection with their parents, Steve, both on the outside and the inside, now you're on the outside now, but uh, as a former life without the possibility of parole prisoner, and I say former and I emphasize that and welcome home, uh, what were some of the barriers that your children faced when they came to see you? Uh, well, I would say, you know, that children face the economic problems of their parents. So if, if the parents are wealthy enough to, and I mean wealthy, I use that very sparingly because I'm not wealthy at all, and nor is my wife, that um, it takes money for gas to get out there, upkeep of the car, the, the hotel that they're going to stay in if they stay in for two days, also to buy food. Like it, there's a lot of economics that go in. That's what I kind of say our marriage was. Our marriage was a marriage of economics. That if she had the money, I was able to see my wife and my girls. If she didn't have the money, I, wouldn't, I was not able to see them. And so that's a giant barrier that I believe kids have to face for visiting. Now, when it comes to writing, you know, kids don't really, in my experience, my girls didn't write me every week. I would write them letters and sometimes there was just no response. And that's just what it is. Like as a parent, when you're incarcerated, you just have to continue to write and hope that the message is landing home. I, I would also say that when I was A2B, I only had one call a month. So during that one 15-minute call a month, I would have to try to talk to my wife 
Um, and I didn't have girls at the time, but if I did have my girls, then I would have had to try to divide that call up because you only get one. And I don't understand what my work privilege has to do with trying to keep my relationships uh, in line. You know, that's just, that's the way it is, the way prison is. And then you get a visit and you only have six hours and you have to divide that, that six hours up to how many people come. I spent most of my time, when, once my girls came, really uh, the attention was on them. And I, there were times where I think my wife felt like, hey, what about me? But, you know, as a life without or a former life without, I was really dedicated to making sure that I broke that, that cycle, that I want my girls to know the pain of incarceration. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Thank you. Would, would really, Courtney, would really like uh, for you to share with us, what are some of those barriers that, that you've seen in the work that you've been doing in your experience uh, that, that children face that want to stay connected to their parents who are incarcerated? Well, some of the barriers that I have seen dealing with these girls in, that are in Girl Scouts are their, like some of their living arrangements, the ability for us to continue to take, to have contact with them. Um, some of them move around a lot and some of them move around from relative to relative. So sometimes it's very, very hard for us to keep contact with them in order for them to go and visit their mothers. Uh, sometimes their mothers, when, because even though I took the girls at least once a month, I still did a visit with the mothers just myself and the mothers so that we could just have some mother to mother talk and mother to mother time. And some of the things that they would experience would be that they can't contact. Sometimes I, uh, in the program would be the only contact that they would have because I am on the outside so they don't know the last, you know, they were with Aunt Susie and I don't know, can you go by and check? And I would go by and check. And sometimes I would be the only way that they would find out and how to contact each other. So that's one of the barriers that we experience. And also with the prison is just also where I went, it's so limited what they would allow us to do sometimes with some of the girls. And when we did finally get that contact together and they were finally, we were able, I was on the outside, I was able to work it and I was able to get them to come in. You could just see the difference in the girls, the behavior changed, a lot of things that they were going through at one time. You know, once they were able to get in and get those visits, behavior change, their attitudes change, a lot of things were for the better. So it's, it's so important to keep that contact and keep them to be able to go and have that relationship and have that time with their mother. Even if it was once a month, those girls needed that. Absolutely. Uh, Courtney, thank you so much. Uh, from being first a person that experienced the barriers and now as a service provider that actually brings children to visit their parents inside, what are those barriers that, that you've personally seen as a service provider uh, that children face when they, when they want to stay connected to their parents? So, you know, to kind of reiterate and kind of echo what, what everyone's been saying is, is uh, one of the main uh, barriers is a lack of financial resources. Um, it, it is expensive to go and visit your loved one. You have to plan ahead. You have to save up. I mean, uh, having a reliable vehicle, um, having fuel, um, having, you know, meals along the way and lodging expenses. In the state of California, I mean, you all know it's everything is pretty far away from one another. And um, it's been what I've seen, the experience that a lot of these children are in one area, for example, they're, they're in the LA area and their parent is four or five up to, you know, 20 hours, if we're talking about Pelican Bay, away from the LA area. So even just getting to that location, just to see your loved one, you know, under certain restrictions, that alone is, is a barrier. So in addition to that, you know, in, in, when we talk about staying connected, right, phone calls, they're expensive. Uh, like I said, it, with my experience, I had very limited calls with, with, my, with my dad. So a lot of that, again, it stems from lack of financial resources. So um, it, that tends to be the, the common trend that we see with our, with our families. It's just we don't have the resources to make these trips happen and, and establish those connections with our loved ones. Thank you so much. So again, uh, we come back to money. We come back to resources. We come back to $16 billion. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's just mind boggling. And the reason why I keep bringing that up is because again, in 2012, the population aside, CDCR, 
was about 170,000. It's about 126,000 now. So you're like, ah, 50,000 people less. Why is the budget now 16 billion as opposed to 9 billion back then? Uh, what went up? Like, did, the, did we build a new prison? No, we didn't. I mean, so, so those things, and especially when we're talking about young people, when we're talking about children that need their parents, we're talking about family reunification, we're talking about humanizing people that are behind wall, walls. Why can't 1% of that budget be used to make our system more humane, our system more family oriented, our system something that's better than the system that we have today? Because the system that we have today, and I've described it like this before, is brutal. It's, it's, it's barbaric especially when it comes to women and children, it's barbaric and it needs to change. Uh, Salim, the way we empower people to do this is call your state legislators. Like literally call your state legislators and tell them you want, it, you want this to change. And as bills come up, be aware of them to support these bills where we want to change these things. But voting power, and we'll, get a, we'll be continuing to push this voting power, voting power is how these things change. That budget should not be 16 billion. If it is, it should be 15 billion for CDCR and a billion for families to help be reunited, give programs, help children be able to be closer to their families. If, if we're gonna say it's 16 billion, let's take a billion of that and make sure that families are better supported. Uh, Steven, your experience, and you shared a little bit about like maintaining a, a relationship with your daughters. What was it like? Because they're different as children grow older and the amount of time that you spent inside as, as children get older, they go through these different struggles. What was it like for you maintaining like I have a 20 year old in the other room uh, and you know, they go through that phase where they don't speak. I think it's around 14 when they, they, they speak in one word uh, sentences. And so what was it like for you to be able to maintain that relationship with your daughters? Well, they're both very different for one, you know, you know, people are different, right? So uh, my oldest, uh, she's very tough. You know, I ask her, how are you doing? Fine. What's going on with you? Nothing. I used to get those. Um, and that makes a difficult 15 minute call. And you have to try to, you know, drag the answer out of her because she's not willing to talk about it. Um, my youngest one's a little different. She, she come out right out. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling that way. You know, and you got to acknowledge the feelings. You can't say, hey, don't feel that way. So I would, it's, with her, it's a little bit easier. My oldest one, though, um, I think Liz talked about it, is that when I was getting visits with her, she was doing good. And as soon as the visits would stop, either for a lockdown or because the money wasn't there, she would act up, she would get in trouble at school. So I'm very aware of that. And I would try to, you know, I try to work through the trauma of, you know, her not having a parent there or her dad. I mean, there was one time where her, uh, she hid like a parent, like a permission saying there was gonna be a father daughter day at school. And she hid the slip in the backpack and my, my wife found it. And that just, that would tear me up. I'd be like, damn, you know, and, and because she knew that I couldn't be there. And so maintaining those relationships it, it sucks. It's hard. It's like you really have to work on it. If you really want the best for your children, you got to work on it. And I would like to just add that I believe, like on the conversation that you're having about this $16, $16 billion budget that CDCR has, that they really only offer like $5 million in grant money to the CBOs. And so from what I'm aware of, there's only two uh, CBOs that work on family unification, that's get on the bus and place for grace. You know, the programs are very limited. Like I never was at a prison where place for grace ran their camp. I only was there when they, uh, one of the select prisons where they, they run like the book, the reading program. Uh, I was never at a prison where they had get on the bus. And then like right before I was pro, get on the bus started going to Ironwood. So it was very, you know, I just had this, the, the, the visits in the six hours at a time. That was my relationship and my, and my phone, 15 minute phone calls with my daughters. It's rough. So, so thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. So, so I have a couple of questions from, from, from the audience first. Uh, Alyssa, what support early on do you think could, could help with your progress in transitioning with your mom? What, what more supports can, can we figure out? Because remember, you're, you have a powerful voice here. and We want to hear your voice as a person with a parent that's inside. What resources can, can, can help uh, better support you and your mom's relationship? That's crazy because uh, right before you said something, I was just reading the question like, dang, how do I answer this? Like, truthfully like with with my whole heart so that people really hear what i'm saying um well truthfully for a long time i i was very what what's the right word like under the bus about everything like i didn't really know what was going on i just knew like my mom wasn't going to be coming home for a while and like 
I, I never knew when like a while was, you know. I just I just kept having the hope that she was gonna come home like maybe next month. Okay, well maybe next year. Okay, well maybe maybe not this next year, maybe the year after next. And it just turned into a whole lot of years of wasteful I wanna say like I, I had a lot of anger inside of me because I felt as if everyone was lying to me. Like no one was telling me the truth. No one really was telling me about my mom. And then when I finally got old enough to go ask my mom, you know, and I, I found out the reason behind everything. And it, it's very hard as a child with my mom being locked up because a lot of a lot of people in my family felt as if like my mom, me and my mom's relationship didn't matter anymore because she was locked up, you know? So they were like, well, your mom's opinion doesn't mean anything. And it took a lot of power away from her um, because they felt as though she didn't deserve to have any parental rights. But my mom was very, she tried very hard to be active in my life. And I appreciate it 100%. Most of these tattoos I got with her, okay, you know? But um, truthfully, early on, I really feel like if, if people are more honest with their children and, and the children know like, okay, well, this is what it is, you know? I feel like that helps. With me, I felt like that would have helped more if, if I just got more truthful answers rather than beating around the bush and sugarcoating and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm glad I, I didn't know, like younger. I feel like in terms of support, just being there for kids that, you know, have their parents locked up and, and knowing that when we act out, it's really just, we just want our mom to, you know, tell us to be there and really try to fix stuff. I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> No, you 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 spoken powerfully in in a, in a way that I I fully understand as a father. As I said before, my daughter grew up without me and and inside, and even being home now, like we still struggle with a lot of the uh, emotional toll uh, on on me not being there. One, like just like, and, and I get that acting out and just wanting to be able to have your parent there uh, to tell you either stop or it's gonna be all right, or just to give you a hug. Yeah, and, and I want to uh, I wanna go back to what Steven said about how his, uh, the one word answers and the whole like acting tough thing and speaking as an older child with my mom being locked up, I would give my mom those one little, uh, those one little word answers acting like I'm okay. And that was just because me being an older child, I knew that my mom was already stressed out enough being locked up, being away from her kids, you know? I didn't want to put any stress on her that didn't need to be on her. So if I had a bad day at school, like, what is that? You know, she's in jail forever. What is my bad day at school compared to her being in jail forever? You know, I, I understand what you have went through, Stephen, and I hope that, I hope that things, you know, she, she started opening up more, but I hope from what I said, you you get as to, you know, maybe why. Just so you know, Alyssa, there are a bunch of panelists that say you're amazing. Oh, <laughs> so you got thanks, you guys. I'm, I'm doing what I do over here, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so to one of our panelists' questions earlier, how do we change the $16 billion, uh, that's allocated? So that's, a, 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 again, our state legislature makes those decisions. And again, calling our state legislator, being in, in, informed about when the budget is, you have a voice if you vote. Your, your voice is your vote. And tell them what, what your polls will tell them what you think money should be spent on. And so when you see these things, make sure that you get on the phone, you email, they hear you when you write letters. And, and even to families that have incarcerated people or, 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 or incarcerated family members, write letters from inside. They read those letters. Our electeds read those letters. They don't think that your voices are, like, are, not, are not being heard. We'd like to ask a, a question. Uh, Courtney, programs like get Girl Scouts Beyond Bars and, and, and Get On the Bus, both Courtney and Liz, and Courtney, please go first, uh, uh, provide support to parents and relationships through, through incarceration. Uh, how, like, what, can you give us a little bit deeper understanding of, of those supports are like for parents? Okay, so the support that we give, <clears throat> that we give, we make sure that they do see their uh, daughters. So if their daughter is in the program, we have visits once per month. And we do realize that some of those girls have siblings and other family members. So every quarter, every three months, we have what we call family visits. Because we serve, uh, the communities that we serve, a lot of them are underserved 
communities. And as you guys stated earlier, it is very hard for some of them to get to the prison because we know that most prisons are our hour or two hours away, usually from where, from the city, from where the people live. So not only do we make sure that they have that connection with their girl every quarter, four times per year, we do take the entire family. That's brother, sister, caregiver, aunt, whoever is on that list, we take all of them to the visits with us. So we make sure that they stay connected that way. And then we also, with the girls, what we offer for them is just a unit outside of the prison with their Girl Scouts, the ones that's in Girl Scouts with them, because a lot of times they go to different schools, but they don't know that their mother is incarcerated. So when they come and they meet with us, they find other girls that are going through the same things that they're going through. They have mothers that are incarcerated. And when that mother gets out, we still provide services to that girl and to that mother. I had some just recently got out. We still, uh, cause we send a cab to pick them up. If they have a job interview, they call us, they need help. We help them with their resume. So we support them not only while they're in incarcerated, but when they get out, we still offer that support and stay in contact with them. And their daughter remains in Girl Scouts until they age out. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, Liz, same question. Like, can you give us a little bit, uh, a deeper delve into understanding the relationship between parent and child? Absolutely. So, you know, just, just to kind of break it down a little bit, um, just to remind everyone how those visits typically look, right, is, um, it's a cold, stoic environment when you go visit your loved one inside a prison, right? So um, aside from the fact that Get on the Bus provides transportation and meals along the way, lodging uh, expenses are covered as well. Uh, we provide a counselor in the bus um, for, you know, to help the children unpack these experiences after they've, they've uh, visited with their parent. Aside from all of that, uh, the experience that we provide, I want to say, is, is what really makes an impact, right? Because the relationship that we've established, I mean, we've been doing this for 20 years, and, and everyone knows Get on the Bus. You see those purple shirts, they stand out. Alyssa, I see you. I see you. <laughs> you look great. So these things, it, you know, having that kind of relationship um, where the correctional officers are actually smiling when they see those Get on the Bus shirts, they they're a little more embracing. The environment's slightly different where, you know, we're usually capped at five visitors uh, per, per family. You know, when it's get on the bus, hey, if there's six kids, seven kids, you know, are, we're able to make an exception with these relationships that we've established over, over the years. So the experience is much more a cohesive one between um, children and their parents, right? Where, uh, and I always like to explain it this way a parent is able to be a parent during one of these visits. And I say this because you're able to embrace your child. You're able to do your child's hair. You're able to serve your child uh, lunch. You know, you're able to be that, that parent that you haven't had an opportunity to offer for a long time. So a child experiences, you know, having, whether it's a scolding, why, why did you comb your hair today? And these things that we ordinarily take for granted out here, we're able to provide those moments and those snippets of parenting and, and uh, all that good stuff that we ordinarily miss. In addition to that, we also, um, you know, what we're doing, and, and I, I know we kind of um, discussed this a little bit earlier regarding the pandemic, right? We've opened up to, two, to new opportunities. What else can we do to keep families connected? Um, you know, with us, we were able to provide uh, our loved ones on the inside uh, what we call Stay Connected kits. We sent over to all of our participating Get on the Bus members, we sent over some stamps, some stationery, some envelopes to keep that connection going. And um, we've provided for Father's Day, uh, what we call Father's Day, it was a Father's Day initiative and um, families from Get on the Bus and several different, um, actually it was opened up to, to all the institutions in the state of California that were run for, from CCR um, to produce a video of support and uh, wishing their, their loved ones on the inside a happy Father's Day. And these videos have been, as, my, I, as I understand, they're still being shown at all the institutions in the state of California. So family members were able to say, we miss you, we love you, happy Father's Day. Just imagine, and I say this because we've all experienced, right, living under quarantine. 
if, if you have your, your grandparent, your loved one living in a different household, we've already experienced that feeling of not even not being able to hold our parent, our child. It, imagine that all the time, how stressful, how painful that is. So to be able to provide that experience alone for one day and say, I'm able to hold my child, I'm able to be held by my mom, by my dad, that experience is just priceless. So the fact that we're able to provide that, even if it is once a year, um, you know, if, if we tap into that $1 billion, we can definitely make that possible uh, a lot more throughout the year. But, but that's, that's what we do. We, we're able to provide those experiences. We also have Family Express that uh, is another program uh, that goes in, uh, to CCWF uh, every month. It's, it's a gender approach uh, program that we have specifically for the women's institutions where we are able to connect the uh, children with their, their mothers um, Family Express also uh, offers an annual trip to Pelican Bay. Um, as you, you may know, Pelican Bay is roughly, a, and I say from LA area, where a, a good portion of our families are located. It's about a 22 hour drive to go to Pel Pelican Bay. So to be able to connect, um, it, it, even if it is once a year, to provide those opportunities, um, you know, we, we're, that's what we do. And um, that we've become, pretty comfortable in doing that and delivering that um, to our families and our loved ones on the inside. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, and, and I'm gonna ask you to do some math while, and, and we'll come back and, and ask you this question again. So uh, the math that we're gonna require you to do is from an anonymous attendee who asked the question, how much money would it would have to be raised to, for get on the bus to deliver service to every prison in California? I would say take the high cost of Pelican Bay and multiply that by 35. Unless you already have that figure, let us know. We will come back to you on this. Absolutely. Uh, okay. And so I'd like to ask Steve and CDCR. Actually, this is this is, this will be Courtney, Steve, and, and uh, Liz for CDCR and Department of Corrections in general. Do you believe the need to be the, that there's a need to make better support for family communication during during incarceration? And, and what does that look like? What what would that be to you if you could give me three solid changes that CDCR or the Department of Corrections can make uh, that will make it better for families. Uh, start with you, Steve. Well, I mean, there's like a list of them, right? One I would name uh, longer visiting hours, more visiting days. And I would definitely um, think about maybe having non-uniform correctional officers, officers inside the visiting, you know, a brief off the top of my head. Courtney? So I would agree with Steve, longer visiting hours, it, it, is, it is needed. Um, we do have the luxury when we go, we are, uh, my group is allotted a specific day. So no one is in the visiting room, but myself and my group, which is great. However, as some of the correctional officers, I wish that they may be a training or something on how they should be just a little more empathetic with the girls when they see their mothers. For me, it's all girls, even though it was 10 and under could not could sit on their daughter's lap. So if you if you're 12, you can't sit on your daughter's lap. But we all know that 12 year olds that hasn't been around their mother in the last five years, they want to sit on their mother's lap still. So maybe some different training to some of the correctional officers so they can be a little bit more empathetic to the situation and to the program that we're trying to bring into the prison. And then may, maybe for uh, me, I'm speaking from my experience, I do agree with uh, the, the uniform, maybe some of the, because my biggest thing when I have the little girls, they're afraid of the correctional officers. Some of them are because of the way that they may come off and kind of bark some of the orders. So maybe more training on how to be more empathetic to the situation because everybody's not coming in trying to get over or the little girls are not coming in with anything in their shirts trying to bring it into their moms they just genuinely want to sit and hug their moms so so thank you courtney and, and i actually was having that same conversation just as justice should be tempered with mercy yeah. the 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 families that have incarceration or family members that are incarcerated that visiting should be tempered with compassion and that should be a training like these are children and so a smile, hey, there's your dad, go get him here, take this coloring book with you. So just some real, real basic things to make children feel like I'm welcomed here and, and, and not making it such a hard uh, environment to be in. I wanna go to the chat. Did you see this, the question, Alyssa, in the box? Becky asked, Alyssa, I have a 13-year-old granddaughter. 
And when I take her to see her dad in Pelican Bay at the end of the visit, at the end of the visit, as you can imagine, she is incredibly sad. When we leave, she cries and, and is clearly upset. We hug her and we try to console her. Do you have any suggestions on how we can better support her? Honestly, I'm I'm 19 and I still, I haven't seen my mom since December. And I know that the next time I see her, I'm gonna cry when I leave. So I guess the best thing you could really do is just just hug her and tell her that you'll, you're coming again soon. I, I know that always made me feel better. Like, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna get to see her soon. Or just, just tell her like, okay, well, um, they'll be calling soon or, you know, just just the uh, affirmation of like, they're still there, you know? Like, you're just leaving, you're just saying bye, but we're gonna come back, we'll be here soon again. That that always made me feel better, just knowing that I was gonna come back. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that helps. I, I know, I would watch my daughter, she would look at the clock when I was incarcerated, and I remember she would, first she would get quiet, then she would like not want to talk at all because she knew in the next few minutes she would have to be leaving. And at mm -hmm. first, initially, I didn't get it. And then I just asked her what's wrong. And she said, I have to leave you here. And it was hard. Uh, and so what I would always tell her was just with, like, you'll, you'll, the, you'll be back. Your mom will bring you back. Your granny will bring you back. But it was really, really hard for her to have to uh, leave me behind. And, and that's one of the things that I don't think correctional officials understand the impact that it has on young on young children. Uh, so if you if you place safeguards around these children and make the visiting area more welcoming, with more compassion, when a child does leave, although it is still painful, they'll still have the memories of a great visit, not a visit where they felt intimidated or unwel un unwelcome. Yeah, um, and I have a little sister. I'm the oldest of three, so we we turned it into this kind of little tradition that. Right before we leave my mom's, we go and we get uh, ice cream. So like when we go and get ice cream, then we know that the visit is about to be over and it's time for us to say our goodbyes and stuff. But we always like, I'm not gonna say we look forward through the whole visit like for the ice cream, but you know, it was always something like, oh, we can't get ice cream right now. Like we're gonna get it later. We're gonna get it later. Like, and then when we would get the ice cream and we would say bye, like, duh, it would still suck because we were saying bye and we had to leave my mom there, but a little six-year-old with ice cream, they're going to be cool. <laughs> okay. So so that that's an idea, like ice cream machines, some, some type of treat for young children to be able to have as, as, as they leave. And, and I keep going back to this, to this billion dollars that could be spent on, on making it better. Uh, but we, we will definitely talk more about that in the coming weeks. Um, so, so family reunification after incarceration. Steve, you've, you have personal firsthand experience in this in the last year or so. I watched you come home, met you inside, watched the struggle. You're home now. So uh, what do you believe is needed for successful uh, family reunification? Uh, one, I think it also depends on the age of the person when they were incarcerated. So I was 18. I didn't know how to be a son at 18, let alone a dad, a, a husband, a stepfather, or even me, like on this side of, of the wall. And to try to learn those roles, I, yeah, you know, I was 46, but I had, you know, arrested development. I, I still think I'm 18 times, and that's, that's a problem. And parenting classes that they offer inside, they, they, don't, they don't really do you any justice because it's, it's just an abstract concept of what it means to be a parent. And so now that I'm out, I get all the attitude that my wife used to get I get all the crazy, you know, the eye rolling and who do you think you are? And I, I get all that now. And so, you know, I realize now that parenting is a 24 hour job that I have to, um, I have to be there through the attitude and like, okay, you just, you're just mad. You'll get over it. We're going to deal with the problem eventually. So, so I'm doing that. It, it, it is rough. Um, it wasn't, it was like culture shock almost because this is what it is and there's no time out. I'm not going to go back to my cell you know, at, at 3.30 and get that time to just think about the problem and then come back and face it at seven or the next morning. No, this is now, they're, the girls are fighting now or they're acting up now and I have to deal with it now. Uh, that was very different for me. It's getting better though, because I think they're realizing that I'm not going anywhere, that I, I haven't gone back to prison or they, you know, because they, they, you know how it is with attachments. They start to get attached, but they're still thinking, oh, what if he leaves again? Or maybe he's not here forever, like permanently within their lives. And so I'm, I'm you know, while we're going through that, everything is getting be a lot better. So that's, you know, it's just, it's, 
it's a struggle, but that's how life is. Life, life isn't easy. There's no, um, you know, easy button like on the staple commercials. You got to work through it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it, it cracked me up when you said the eye rolling. Like, uh, oh, yeah. To, to, even today, 20 years old, my, my 20 year old says, I, so now she's got all this responsibility. She's like, I don't like this adult thing. I said, welcome to life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get the whatever in the eye roll. Like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Courtney, uh, what do you believe is needed for successful family uh, reunification after incarceration? Uh, support, as Steve said, you, you don't know how long, maybe it depends on what age they were when they went in. A lot of things have changed. So that family and that incarcerated uh, person needs support. They need guidance. A lot of things may have changed. If you were 18 when you went in and now you're 38, a lot of things have changed. And not only have things changed on the outside, your way of, of thinking has changed. Right. So when you are out, a lot of things you just need, they just need a lot of guidance and support and help. Because like I said, things are so different. They're so, in five years, we know things change. And when someone is locked up in a, in a small area for so long, when they do get out or whatever, we need to support them. This is not out and say, hey, okay, well, we were there with you for these last few years. We brought your kid. Now, hey, now you go. They need to learn how to parent again because it's different, as he said, parenting from the inside as it is parenting on the outside. Parenting on the outside is a little bit different. Now you see this is what the caregiver was talking about. This is that attitude they were telling me about. You know, on the inside, I haven't seen you all month, so we're hugging, we're having fun, doing crafts, doing things together, but now I'm with you every day. And sometimes that, that parenting, those skills need to be touched up a bit. So I think a lot of support for both the child and the person that was incarcerated getting out is what's needed. I 100% agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So I often get the attitude when I say no to certain things. I'm like, okay, we just, time will heal this. You'll be mad for a little while uh, and we'll get back to this, but it's still no. Uh, <laughs> Liz, you've experienced both uh, as a service provider and, and then also having a parent incarcerated and then being reunified with that parent. Again, the, the same question to you, what do you believe is needed for successful uh, family re re uh, reunification? Um. You know, my two cents on that, um, I, I think it's very, very important to to have constant communication throughout um, the parents' incarceration, right? Whether that's uh, through visits, phone calls, letter writing, there has to be some kind of consistency for a child um, to know that there is a parent there. You know, obviously, uh, they're very limited on when, when they can access their, their parent. We understand that, but um, there has to be some form of, of support, you know, after incarceration, it's, it's hard enough to be a parent already, and it's hard enough to deal with a, a growing child um, who is going to be doing the eye rolling and all that stuff. And, and you know, to, to Courtney's point, it, it's, it's very different from when you're inside, right? You have those moments because they're very limited. Um, you have those moments to spend time with your parent. Um, but after the fact, again, there's still a lot of trauma. We have to understand that this is a traumatic experience for a child. It's very challenging. And just like everything else, it takes time to heal through that. And understanding that parent and child can heal through this together, we're going to need some sort of support, some professional support and, and assistance in making these things happen. Because if we just hope and, and dream and, and wish that everything gets better, it's going to be very challenging. We, we need these resources within the community to, to be able to provide that successful reunification and actually have a relationship with your parent. I'll be very honest with you. I don't have a relationship with my father now. And I think, and I say this from my personal experience, a lot of that had to do from the lack of communication that we had while he was incarcerated. So, you know, it's unfortunate, um, but I say I'm a product of that experience. And that's why I'm even, I push this even more because it does make a difference. It's very impactful to continue that relationship, whether even if it is once a month, once a year, whatever, but have some form of consistency for the child and know that their parent is there and their parent loves them. And, 
you know, the separation occurred because of different circumstances, not because of the child's actions. Thank, thank you, Liz. I uh, want to ask both Courtney, Steve, real quickly, if possible. Are you aware of any resources or support for family reunification in the communities? If so, could you cite them real quick? And we'll, we'll follow up. Our, our viewers can email us and we'll share this information. Uh, Steven? Are you talking about like once they're like on this side? Uh, yes, on this side. So a person comes home. Are there? Are, do you? Are you aware of any type of community support for family reunification? Uh, my only support for camp family communication are those fellow formerly incarcerated, like everybody who's gotten out who's been a parent. So like if I have a parenting problem and I know he have a daughter, I'll go to you, or I'll go to James Cabot, or I'll go to, I'll go to me. Like I go to people who already have kids, because they're the only ones I know that have a support network. That's my support network. Thank you, Courtney. So I know here in St. Louis, there are quite a few, um, and we do partner in Girl Scouts, we do partner with different counseling uh, uh, services for the girls. Uh, I do know that they do have like um, Great Circle, um, they have like different transition centers and like better together. They have quite a few here in St. Louis. And then we also in Girl Scouts, uh, we are allowed a budget. And through that budget, I do uh, seek out counseling for the girls and their parents when they are um, when they are released. And and I want to ask this on uh, this is this is I want to ask this on behalf of Alyssa. Does anyone know about any type of resources or supports for young people who have parents like are, are, are there resources in our community for young people that have supports? Because I remember my daughter saying that she had one friend who had a parent that was incarcerated, but there were no organizations that could give support. Uh, does anyone know any organizations like that? So we could definitely make sure that Alyssa and others that, that may have family, that are, are parents that are incarcerated can plug into those supports uh, in California. Well, I know Project Kinship in Orange County offers like a uh, uh, at promise youth type counseling and uh, James Cabot's the one that runs that. So I take my daughters, I take my daughters there. Okay, Alyssa, can you pl please plug in with Nick and, and, and uh, Steven and, and that's the support you could check out. It might be something that, that, that uh, can do more. And we, we need to figure out how to do more for our young people that have their parents that are incarcerated. Yeah, for sure. Well, for me, my support was really my siblings, just because they, they knew what it was like to also not have my mom here. I would just mostly, well, now, okay, this is going to be funny. But now we, we kind of crack jokes about my mom being in jail, you know, like, We'll be like, uh, like I'll hit my brother or something, and he'll be like, "You better stop before I go and call mom." And I'm like, "Huh, good luck with that." Like, you know, <laughs> it, it's we we mostly rely on each other now. So my support system is my siblings, and yeah, because I can't crack those jokes with my cousins; they think I'm weird. <laughs> so I I have to just you know, I just talk to my siblings, and that's that's pretty good for me. I don't really like talking to people like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We get it. Like, trust us, we, we get it. Uh, we, so, so know that you're supported. Know that there's a comment. A couple of people says you're a survivor, one, you're powerful. Uh, you're a young woman with, that is wise. Thank you for your advice and sharing. Uh, so, so just know, people, you have a fan club, okay? Hey, you, you, guys know, you guys know I make music too, right? <laughs> no, I'm okay. just kidding. But uh, yeah, really my siblings and, and my mom's friend, Blanca, she was really close with my mom when they were like, when they were locked up together. And then when Blanca got released, she came home and like, you know, put me under her wing and stuff. And so, so now I, I kind of bug Blanca with my problems. So I look at her as another form of support, but really just formally, I feel like I get along well with people that have been through that incarceration struggle. So not only do I do I get along with kids and stuff? But I also, I also get along well with adults, and I have since I was very young. Okay. And while I he have you here uh, uh, right now, Alyssa, could you give us closing thoughts? Give me about a minute closing thoughts. Anything you want to leave the audience with? Uh, yes. I hope everyone is listening. So look, I really, <laughs> I really want to hold on. Let me let me make sure this shirt is in frame. <laughs> I really want to say thank you to Get On The Bus, and I would really like more funding to go towards Get On The Bus, because as much as I love Cheez-Its and Ritz crackers, I would um, very much so like more snacks, and uh, I know there's a bunch of little kids that um, are cool with goldfish and stuff, but um, I'm an adult now, and I would very much so like Capri Suns and um, chips, 
And I just want to say um, thank you to everybody that's been tuning in and listening. I really hope everyone has, you know, you know, get on the bus and just just thank you for for listening and hearing what we had to say. And I hope I hope drop LWAP and I hope all this stuff happens. And I hope my mom comes home so that me and my mom can get on and, and start talking about, you know, change and all that. Thank you for listening to me because I know I don't be talking about much. No, you talk about you powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Uh, uh, Courtney, uh, closing thoughts that you would like to leave the audience with? Um, I would just uh, like to just say that these these children, because I say girls because I work directly with the girls, but these children um, just need to be reminded that they are loved and they are wanted and they are needed. Um, they need to be reminded of that. And the mothers or and the people that I deal with, which are women, so the mothers, need to be reminded that they are people. They, I am just one mistake from being where they are. They need to be treated like people. They need to be treated with respect just because they made a mistake or they did something in their past. They, when they get out and they try to do better, we should look at them as people that are trying, as people and they're trying to do better. Not an inmate or, in a, or what I'd like to say, a person that has been incarcerated because you are able to move past your mistakes and we need to understand that and we need to respect them because they just want what the rest of us want and that's to provide and be who we need to be for our children thank you courtney powerful thank you so much liz a, a minute uh, for, so liz a minute uh, for closing thoughts that you would like to share with the audience and answer that question to fund get on the bus to go to every prison how much is, what's the price tag on that? We got, now we're, we're going to say every prison in the state of California, uh, and then we're going to keep it at once a year. Is that kind of where we were at? Because that, that's the number I came up with. Okay, because we can multiply that after you. So once a year? Absolutely. So if it were uh, once a year, it'd be 1.3 million. Um, and it's, if we do once a month, that would be 15.6 million. That's what we're looking at. And that's, that's just uh, keeping the bucket of a billion dollars that we could get from CDCR. This is Easily. what I'm saying. This, this is what I'm saying. Like a billion, 15 million, not even a scratch in the surface. Yep. Thank yep. you. Uh, and, and last thoughts for our audience, please. Well, and that includes replacing those goldfish snacks. So, uh, you know, we'll get rid of that for you. <laughs> but uh, last minute thoughts, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of have a snippet now of what it feels like to be apart from our loved ones, being in quarantine and all of that. Um, imagine, you know, seeing your loved one and being so limited and restricted on the things you can do, you can do with your loved one. It's interfering with the ability to have that special relationship to Courtney's point, these are human beings. And I feel like as a society that tends to be forgotten often. We need to remind ourselves that, hey, you know, if if you are limited on the compassion you may have for our loved ones on the inside, fine, think of the kids, think of the children, how is this affecting them? And this is just pushed out to society. So even if you're not in any way, shape or form, connected that you feel you're not connected to these children you are these kids go to the same kids to the same school that your kids go to and you better believe that they're being affected by it so it impacts us all the same it, it, in different levels and we have to keep that in mind and that's why everyone needs to participate when it comes to making sure that these family reunifications are happening thank you so much liz and steve last but definitely not least uh closing thoughts for our audience uh, in life without, uh, in mass incarceration, you know, we need to bring Alyssa's mom home, but she's got LWAP, definitely need to end that. Uh, I definitely 100% agree that 1% of the budget for CDCR should be simp uh, spent on CBOs. That is a very small, minute amount of money compared to what they get. I would also like to say that the children of the incarcerated parent, are they paying for the sin of the parent. They're the most under resourced and under focused on group that I think that I can name and I think all that needs to change that's for sure. Thank you Stephen greatly appreciate you. Thank you Liz, thank you Courtney, thank you Alyssa, thank you audience for joining us. Joining us. Uh, I'd like to give a call to action now. So as you know ACA 6 passed. It passed yesterday. Free the vote. 
Free to Vote, Free to Vote, which is a ballot initiative now to restore the voting rights for people that are on parole in California. That's about 53,000 people that cannot vote right now. Please make sure that you vote yes to restore the right to vote for people that are on parole. End this disenfranchisement. So it's hashtag end disenfranchisement. It will be on our ballot. Look for PSAs, look for social media announcements. This will be on our ballot in November. Uh, to all of the community-based organizations and our electeds that pushed this forward, all of us did this. This was a collective effort. How to stay in touch with ARC, you will see it on our, uh, that, that's on our screen right now. There it is there. Please stay in contact. Look at our social media. We put out information continuously. Uh, follow our guests on social media. Follow Get on the Bus on social media. Follow Bo uh, Girl Scouts Beyond Bars on social media. All of their information is right there on the screen. Please follow them. Please support them. Share this information with other, other organizations. Share this information with communities. Know that we're in this together in order for us to completely end mass incarceration, not just in California, but across this nation and heal our country. We have to do this together and we have to be united. Thank you all. Next week, we will not be on the air. The following week, we will be, have, you will, we will be pushing out uh, another show that will be incredible with incredible panelists such as those that have been here today. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and blessings to all.